This is Kelly Ebersole from the International Alliance for Phytobiomes Research. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. We're pleased to have with us Alexandra Weisberg, uh, who will be giving us a presentation. But before we get to that, I'll go through a little bit about the Phytobiomes Alliance and uh, what are some of our next webinar uh, will be in our series. So the International Alliance is a nonprofit consortium of industry, academic, and governmental scientists. Thanks to our sponsors um, representing industry, academia, and uh, governmental institutions, we are able to actually bring this webinar series to you. So a lot of people have asked, what's a phytobiome? And it's a complex system of plant-based agriculture. Biomes are really site-specific environments, and it's the concept of a plant in that site-specific environment. And it includes all these different uh, it, uh, components that are interacting with each other, whether it's the weather, whether it's microbiomes or macroorganisms, other plants, other animals, and of course, sitting in soil or, or not sitting in soil if you're in a water-based system. And all of this is influenced by management practices. The Phytobiomes Alliance vision is to, by 2050 that all farmers will have the ability to use predictive and prescriptive analytics based on geophysical and biological conditions for determining the best combination of crops, management practices, and inputs for a specific field in a given year. Our next webinar will be uh, the 10th of September, 10th of September, and uh, it will be led by William Hay from USDA ARS, who will give a talk on ensuring food safety and security, evaluating and utilizing plant pest pathogen phytochemical interactions. You can register by going to this link, and you can also register to our mailing list to generally receive news about events organized by the Alliance. Um, that seems a long time away, so we may have others in the other webinars that uh, we schedule before September, so be sure and uh, stay abreast through our mailing list. So just so that everyone will know, the webinar will be recorded and will be posted on the Phytobiomes Alliance YouTube channel in a few days. The presentation section will be followed by Q and A's, and if you have questions, I encourage you to submit them through the Q&A panel. Do not use the chat as when we're going through those questions that we may miss a, a really important question. So please use the Q&A panel. And even if we don't get to your question today, we'll try to get you an answer uh, individually um, after the presentation. If you want to talk with the fellow attend, your fellow attendees or other organizers, feel free to use the chat. And I would encourage you all to download the handouts from the presentations that are included in the handout panel. So with this, I'd like to, again, turn it over to Alexandra Weisberg from Oregon State University. She's gonna to talk today about genomic approaches to epidemiology and diagnostics of phytopathogens, tracking the global spread of agrobacteria. Alexandra was a first author on this uh, topic in a science publication earlier this summer. So Alexandra, thank you for joining us and I'll turn it over to you now. Well, thank you very much uh, for that introduction. So, Let me just set up my PowerPoint slides. Sorry, just having a quick camera issue. Is it showing 
Yes, yeah, so we're getting we're getting your slide, but we've lost the picture of you. There we go. Yes. Okay, it's just trying to minimize. Yeah. Okay. Is that better? Is that working? Yeah, that's working great. Thank you. All right. Sorry about that. Well, thank you for that introduction. So I'm going to be talking about my research on the epidemiology and uh, diagnostics of agrobacteria and how we our research was used to track the global spread of agrobacteria. So our research focuses on improving plant health, particularly in the context of disease. So modern genome sequencing has brought tremendous power to identify and track the spread of pathogens. And our goal was to apply this to agriculture as the technology allows us to see what is happening in never before seen detail. Uh, this is timely as despite what you may have seen in the news, 2020 is the year or the international year of plant health. Um, and we're all, likewise, we also do epidemiology, which is also timely. However, we're focused on the plant side of things. So I also wanna note that since this is a webinar and it's difficult to ask questions, I've added slide numbers to the bottom right of each slide. So if you have any questions later, you can reference a specific slide that way. So before I show you the details of this research, I just wanna quickly say that this was a large team effort from a lot of researchers and they all brought different skill sets and expertise. And this work would not have been possible without all of them as mentors and collaborators. So some of the big questions that we're interested in are, um, is how plant associated bacteria spread. So plants harbor uh, and interact with incredibly diverse communities of bacteria. Some of these interactions are beneficial, such as with rhizobial symbionts while others are detrimental and include many potential pathogens, such as the one I'm gonna talk about today. In many cases, genes on mobile genetic elements, such as plasmids or genomic islands, uh, can cause a bacteria to transform from a commensal or otherwise harmless organism into a pathogen or a symbiont. And these mobile elements move independently of the strains themselves and complicate our ability to track disease spread. So human agricultural practices and movement may also play some role in the spread of these organisms and their genes. So while this is a story about agrobacterium tumefaciens, we aren't just using these techniques we developed for this group of bacteria, but we also applied it to these other ones as well. Uh, we recently studied the spread of the plant pathogen Rhodococcus fashions, which causes leafy gall disease. We're also collaborating with Joel Sachs at UC Riverside to study how genomic islands confer the ability to form symbioses with plants, um, as well as a collaboration with Chris, Chris Clark at USDA, studying how genomic islands um, confer the ability to cause disease on potato, to cause common scab disease for the organism Streptomyces. And what you can see is that in these two cases, these mobile elements are plasmids. Whereas in these two, they're genomic islands. And these two organisms are gram-positive bacteria and these are gram-negative. And so you can see there's many different ways that these, um, these uh, can occur, these different systems. So this talk will focus exclusively on agrobacterium. And I'm gonna show you the methods that we developed and the power of these methods. But just remember that we also are applying it to different groups of bacteria and it will work there too as well. So this is the essential outline of what I'm gonna talk about today. So our major goal is this last step, understanding the epidemiology of the pathogen agrobacterium tumefaciens. However, in order to do that, we had to work backwards and understand both the evolution of the organism itself, as well as that of the plasmids that confer the ability to infect plants. So without that information, we would have had too many false positives and misleading results. And so what I'm gonna tell you is how we determine the evolution of agrobacterium um, and then how that was useful to model the spread of the bacteria and the plasmids. By modeling both of them, we have a much higher resolution on how disease is being spread. So many of you are probably familiar with crown gall disease. It's a major problem in the US causing millions of dollars in damage uh, each year in the nursery industry, The orchards and vineyards, and crown gall manifests as these large masses of undifferentiated tissue or galls 
and it's particularly an issue on grapevine um, as well as fruit trees and nursery plants and all of these are important agricultural products here in Oregon. So they often occur at the site of plant wounds, such as graft unions or plants grown from cuttings, um, and they can reduce, result in graft failure or reduced yield. So we recently heard from an apple grower uh, who had to discard $500,000 worth of infected rootstock that would have produced $2 million worth of trees, and that's just at one site. Um, and so a related pathogen also causes hairy root disease, which is um, essentially masses of roots growth at the site of infection. Um, and these all, both of these types of pathogens affect a wide range of host plants, and there's no cure for crown gall, so the infected plants must be destroyed. So the organism responsible for crown gall disease is Agrobacterium tumefaciens, so it's a gram-negative bacteria. And Agrobacterium with a TI plasmid is unique, in that it facilitates an interkingdom transfer of DNA. So this agro TI plasmid can genetically transform a plant with a, set, a region of the, the TI plasmid called the tDNA. And once this plant is transformed, it'll cause the plant to form a large gall and then produce nutrients for the bacteria. So I won't go into details on that here, but I'd be happy to talk to you about it afterwards. So the TI plasmids are of interest because they carry all of the genes that are necessary to cause disease. So each plasmid has at least one tDNA, which is the region of DNA transferred into the plant. And they also carry VIR genes, which facilitate this transfer via a type 4 secretion system. They also have genes for producing and catabolizing uncommon nutrients called opines, as well as genes for plasmid replication and plasmid conjugation. So these conjugation genes are what really complicates our ability to understand agrobacterium epidemiology. So these genes encode for another type 4 pilus uh, that allows the plasmid to conjugate from one bacteria into another one. And agrobacterium can conjugate TI plasmids across species groups. So this will create new pathogenic lineages that can then infect plants. And the crown gall environment um, also stimulates this function uh, to encourage the spread of the plasmid widely to other bacteria. Um, and so the TI plasmids can therefore move independently of the strains themselves. So plasmid conjugation rep represents a kind of horizontal gene transfer. However, fragments of plasmids can also move around, such as between plasmids, which complicates our ability to understand how they evolve. So why is studying the epidemiology of agrobacterium or agricultural pathogens in general so difficult? So in the plant-associated world, many non-pathogens are similar to pathogens, and plants harbor these diverse communities of organisms. And many of the genes necessary for virulence in a pathogen, such as a type 3 secretion system, can be found in commensals as well. Um, so the strains themselves are also incredibly genetically diverse. And as you'll see in a little bit, Agrobacterium comprises of four major lineages of more than 20 species level groups, and each of these can become pathogens. So this diversity complicates genome-based methods, and we need to generate a robust phylogeny to understand how these strains relate. But the most important issue in this case is that a conjugative plasmid confers virulence. So the pathogenicity is entirely dependent on the presence of a TI or RI plasmid. So the problem there is that the tools that were developed around evolutionary theory for epidemiology um, are not applicable to plasmids. These plasmids are conjugative and they can spread um, on their own independently of the strains themselves. And they're also very diverse as well. Um, in many cases, or in many ways, these plasmids are more diverse than the strains themselves. So these plasmids can gain and lose genes um, to change in major ways very quickly through horizontal gene transfer. So to get into answers to these questions, we utilized two resources. So we worked with Melody Putnam, the director of the OSU Plant Clinic, and the Plant Clinic performs diagnostics of plant samples for growers and nurseries across the Pacific Northwest. So Melody provided us with agrobacterium that had been recently isolated from uh, various nurseries. And we also utilized the Larry Moore Culture Collection. So Larry Moore was a researcher at Oregon State for many years. 
and the, the novel lineage of Agrobacteria, Agrobacterium Larry Mori, was named after him. Um, and he has this tremendous collection of Agrobacterium that we were able to use as a resource. So we selected more than 150 Agrobacterium isolates from this collection and from other sources. And we sequenced the genomes of these isolates on an Illumina HiSeq or an, a Nanopore Minion, depending on the strain. Um, and then the genome sequences were then de novo assembled, annotated, and then used for further analysis along with strains that are available from NCBI. So our first sequencing run focused on historical strains, and we were trying to maximize diversity. So these strains were isolated over nearly a century, and they were isolated from six continents and more than 50 plant host species. And these strains were used to calibrate our methods and provide a genetic framework of agrobacterium. Our second sequencing run included more than 60 strains that were recently isolated. And these were from plant samples that were submitted to the OSU plant clinic. So these samples were our test case to understand the epidemiology of current infections. So the first step was to classify our strains and understand how they relate to each other. So this is an MLSA tree of 1,000 genomes made from 24 housekeeping genes. Uh, we also used whole genome comparisons, such as average nucleotide identity, so ANI or POCP. And these were also consistent with the groupings in this tree. So the colored dots on this tree indicate new agrobacteria that were sequenced as part of the study. Um, and what's really important to see is that agrobacteria are very diverse. And each of these major lineages of agrobacteria are more closely related to other bacteria, such as rhizobia, than they are to each other. So this really complicates things. Um, so using this tree and ANI and POCP and the next tree that I'm going to show you, we're able to generate a really robust classification of the strains themselves. So this is a way to visualize all the data I've generated. Um, and without this information, we didn't have any context for making inferences about evolution or horizontal gene transfer or the spread of disease. So these are the three major clades of agrobacteria. So this is Biovar 1, uh, so-called agrobacterium tumefaciens, which is comprised of multiple species level groups, shown here. Uh, this is Biovar 2, so-called rhizobium rhizogenes, but it, both of these clades can carry TI or RI plasmids and they can share them with each other. This clade here is Biovar 3 or Agrobacterium vitis. And it's a host limited uh, species that can only cause disease on grapevine. And the TI plasmids carried by this strain are only found in Biovar 3. Um, and then this is another clade of host range limited agrobacteria as well. So now that we know the groupings, Estimating time also provides a context for evolutionary relationships. So this is another tree similar to the MLSA tree, but the important difference here is that this tree is estimating the time of divergence between strains and lineages. So we can use this information to better understand the diversity that we see in the tree. So this is a Bayesian time tree made from eight neutrally evolving genes. Um, and for most taxa, the structure of the tree is very similar to the MLSA tree. So Biovar 3 is in a, um, a little different, and uh, I don't want to go into details on that here, but I'm having to talk about it later. But the main point is that we can estimate the time of divergence for each of the major agrobacteria biovars. So um, here we can see Biovar 1 diverged about 6, 59 million years ago. Um, Biovar 3 diversified about 16 million years ago. And then here's Biovar 2, which has very little diversity. Um, and it's really interesting because this, this Biovar emerged relatively recently, um, around 1.6 million years ago. And other metrics um, that we looked into also suggest that Biovar 2 might be emerging from a genetic bottleneck. So if we were just interested in the epidemiolo epidemiology of Biovar 2, this would be very easy because it's a very similar group of bacteria. However, we're also interested in these other agrobacteria as well. So while it was very important to classify the strains, understandably, most of the attention on agrobacterium is focused on the TI plasmids. So the plasmid is driving this effect on the interaction with the plants. 
So if we want to trace the movement of the plasmids as well, we also need to classify them very robustly. So I previously showed you that the TI plasmids all have several essential elements, such as the tDNAs and the VIR genes. Um, however, beyond these genes, the plasmids themselves are very diverse. So at the time we started this study, there were only five available sequence plasmids, and all of them differed from each other in sequence, arrangements of the major loci, and gene content. There was also evidence of horizontal gene transfer of these genes between TI plasmids. And because of this, it had previously been viewed as nearly impossible to model their evolution and classify the plasmids. So this was a major challenge for the epidemiology aspects because we needed a way to compare the different plasmids to each other across strains. So I'm going to go over how we classified the TI plasmids. So this slide looks fairly complicated, but I'm just going to go over it at a high level. Um, and if you want to read more details about that, you can find that here in the paper or I can talk to you later. Um, but essentially, we used multiple methods to classify the TI and RI plasmids. And fortunately, they were all consistent with each other. So we used methods such as shared KMER content over here, uh, gene content, gene phylogeny, as well as plasmid structure and arrangement. And fortunately, each of these methods um, were consistent in grouping them into six TI plasmid types and three RI plasmid types. So despite this diversity, we were able to classify them into just a limited number of plasmid lineages. And we use this information to model the evolution of the plasmids and how they relate to each other. So when I classify the TI plasmids into types, it's as if we're identifying species of plasmids. So it's important to identify species of bacteria so you can understand why we'd want to do the same for the plasmids. So we were able to model the evolution of agrobacterium and the plasmids, which is great, but how can we use this information? So we're interested in a number of aspects of agrobacterium epidemiology. We want to know how agrobacterium spreads both within nurseries or between nurseries uh, or growing sites. We also want to know how the plasmids impact the spread of disease and the creation of new pathogenic lineages. So is there movement of strains between growers and nurseries? Do nurseries host multiple infections of different strains of agrobacteria? Does plasmid conjugation play a role uh, in infection? So understanding each of these is going to help us in preventing the spread of disease and managing infections by agrobacteria. So most methods to track outbreaks and epidemiological patterns use whole genome sequencing. So these methods have been developed for different human pathogens but the overall approach is the same. So sequencing reads are mapped to a common reference genome and single nucleotide differences or polymorphisms or SNPs are um, called uh, for each strain. And then strains are then clustered into clonal genotypes based on pairwise SNP differences, but the SNP threshold is fairly arbitrary. So uh, if strain X and strain Y differ by one SNP, then you would see that they're very, very similar to each other. But if they differ by tens of thousands of SNPs, then they're pretty different strains. So the fewer the SNPs, the more closely related they are. And below some threshold, we think of them as clonal expansion. So then once we have the strains clustered into genotypes, outbreaks can be tracked by comparing these genotypes to each other of clonal isolates um, to, and between patients or locations. So this is a minimum spanning network where circles represent clones, and each of these are colored based on the location or the patient or the date that they were um, isolated from. And the larger they are, the more strains they represent, and each clone is connected to the most closely related other genotypes of clones. And so these clones, um, in the medical world, you may interview patients, determine if they came in contact with others, and then draw inferences from that. But since plants can't talk, we have to use other methods. So this is something that would be really useful to know for agrobacterium. So why hasn't something like this been done before? So in contrast with many human pathogens, agrobacteria are extremely diverse. So as I showed you, there's four major lineages of multiple species groups. Um, 
each of which can be pathogens. And choosing a good reference genome for SNP calling is very important, since a distant reference uh, will result in many misleading false positive or false negative SNPs, uh, which can impact your result. And so this genetic diversity of agrobacterium really makes it difficult to pick one single reference genome that all strains can be compared to. So what we discovered is that if we don't use the right reference, there's a high false discovery rate. So we know this because we have isolates that we know to be clonal. They came from the same plant. Um, and what happened was that when they first appeared to all have hundreds of SNP differences between each other, despite being essentially clones. However, when we accounted for the strain relationships and chose a much closer reference genome, it went to zero SNP differences as expected. So too many false positives lead to very low signal. Um, so now you can see why it was so important to understand the evolution of agrobacteria themselves. So for generating a whole genome phylogeny, just picking any old reference genome would probably be okay. But when it comes to epidemiology and linking two growers together or two nurseries together, we wanna to be very certain that these strains are truly genetically identical as there's economic and legal consequences to this. So with the most important issue though, is that pathogenicity in Agrobacterium's case is entirely dependent on the presence of a TI or RI plasmid. So the problem is that the tools developed for epidemiology are not applicable to plasmids. Um, these plasmids themselves are conjugative and can spread horizontally from strain to strain. And as I've just shown you, they're also very, very diverse. So you can see that using this method um, and incorporating plasmids is much more difficult as they're even more diverse. Um, and so we have to understand how they're related as well. So how did we approach this? So the key advance in our study was to model the transmission of the chromosomes and the plasmids independently as uncoupled replicons. So by doing this, we were able to understand how these individual elements were moving independently of each other in nurseries and grower sites. So first, sequencing reads from each strain were separated into those corresponding to the chromosome and those corresponding to the TI and RI plasmids. Uh, for the chromosome, strains were grouped uh, into lineages below the level of the species. And then for each of these species groups, we called SNPs with a, a good reference chosen for that particular lineage of, of strains. Alternatively, we used um, newer graph-based methods of SNP calling, which are better handling diversity. And then clonal genotypes were determined using a 15 SNP threshold. Um, and this was chosen based on observations of the distributions of pairwise SNP differences between all the strains. And then we used a similar analysis separately for the TI and RI plasmids. So we separated all the plasmids into lineages below the level of those plasmid types we observed, and then called SNPs using a per group reference for each of those lineages. So for plasmids, we use the same threshold of pairwise SNP differences to determine clusters of unique plasmids, but we also made sure that each of these plasmids shared more than 97% of their shared gene content. And this was just to ensure that these plasmids truly were the same. And this also allowed for a little wiggle room of gene annotation. Um, so then the key step here was to overlay this information um, and essentially combining the data sets of chromosome and TI and RI plasmids. So um, by combining these data sets, we can ask if the chromosome and the plasmids are moving in phase or if they're moving out of phase with each other. So if they're moving in phase, then plasmids and chromosomes are moving together, presumably as a single strain um, in one bacteria. Otherwise, if they're moving out of phase, that could mean that conjugation may have occurred or something else is happening. So before I show you the final result, I just wanna show examples of some of the possible epidemiological patterns that we saw or that we searched for when we we're looking at these data sets. So here we can see big circles represent um, genotypes of strains, and the little circles inside them represent um, sublineages of plasmid clusters that are carried by those strains. So strains and plasmids may be totally different across different growing sites, suggesting that there's no link of, um, between these sites. 
On the other hand, growers might have reservoirs of the same lineages. So two different growers might have the same strain plasmid combination, suggesting that these are moving in phase and that there may be transmission of pathogens between sites, or at least there's some kind of link um, between these sites. Independent growers might harbor a reservoir of the same strain plasmid combination, or they might harbor multiple infections of different pathogens. We also looked for um, evidence of plasmid conjugation. So either the same plasmid found in different uh, genotypes of agrobacteria or the same genotype of agrobacteria carrying different TI plasmids. And we looked for these either within a single site or across sites. In addition to this, we also looked for temporal patterns. So where the same combination of strain and plasmid is maintained over time, um, either in one location or in multiple locations, or if the same plasmid is um, identified or maintained over time. Um, and so this could be either clonal expansion in one, in one location, or it could be um, in different nurseries. So here's our actual result. So it looks kind of complicated. So I'm gonna break it down in um, a little simpler. But essentially, there's three levels of data here. So using all the SNP calls, we classified strains into unique genotypes and plasmids into unique plasmid clusters. Um, and then we correlated this data together. So on this graph, unique plasmid clusters are represented as circles. So these are colored circles representing an individual unique type of plasmid. And then squares are representing chromosomal genotypes. So these represent a specific lineage of agrobacteria that differ by fewer than 15 SNPs. And these are um, colored based on either the plasma type or the taxonomic lineage. And so what we've done is we've connected these plasmids and genotypes to represent locations where a particular strain with this combination is found. So in this case, we would have this type of TI plasmid in a strain care, um, of this type of genotype of agro found in a particular location. And so these lines are scaled to the count of the occurrences of strains with that combination at that location. And we've also anonymized the nursery information in order to protect the privacy of the growers who had donated these samples to us. So for the next few slides, I'm just gonna go over a few of the key patterns that we saw in this data. So this graph here is, represents a single plasmid type or a single plasmid cluster found in three different um, genotypes of agrobacteria. And I'm gonna focus on this one here because this particular genotype and plasmid combination was found in three different locations. So the same combination of plasmid and genotype was found in three places. And these happen to be two different countries in, and three different locations. Um, and it turns out that one of these locations is actually a supplier of plants. So this is consistent with a potential common source of this strain um, and possibly pathogen transmission between locations um, as the chromosome and the plasmid are moving in phase. So we can't assume directionality between, for these strains. However, the data shows that there's a common link between these nurseries which could indicate the movement of sick plants or some other material. And however, when we see other patterns that differ from this, that indicates that something else must be happening. So we see this type of pattern of the same genotype and plasma combination found um, at least in six other combinations. So seven, seven examples of this. We also have some evidence that there are some nurseries with multiple co-occurring infections. Um, so one nursery site had seven unique combinations of genotype and plasmid. And so it's important, um, this is important to know for this nursery as treatments and biocontrol strains might only be effective against one or some of the strains that are found at that site, but not all of them. So by following the epidemiology of a second molecule, the plasmid, we have much more information on how this disease is spread, and we have the opportunity to extract more information 
than we could have done previously. So if we did detection with just a single marker gene, we may have concluded that this nursery had repeated infection by a reservoir population, but by sequencing the whole genome and the plasmids separately, we can tell that they're completely different genotypes and plasmids. So it's not a reservoir, but it's multiple co-occurring infections. So these two graphs here indicate evidence of long-term persistence, so these graphs. So in this graph, the plasmid cluster, this plasmid type, is found in a strain that was isolated or collected in 1964, while all these other strains have the same plasmid type but were isolated in the 90s or early 2000s. And all of these plasmids differ from each other by fewer than two SNPs. Um, so despite this long time scale, the plasmids are still very similar, suggesting that there's still plasmid transmission occurring over a very long period of time. In this other example, we have a strain and or strain and plasmid that was isolated 60 years apart in two different strain as two different strains. Um, and this is consistent with pathogen transmission and persistence over time. So if we had just looked at the chromosome, we could have concluded that the strain had been around for a long time. But by analyzing the plasmids separately, we can tell that the plasmids also persist for a very long time. So this is new information that we could have not drawn if we didn't do what we did. So there's 15 graphs in our data set where there's a plasmid connected to multiple genotypes of agrobacteria. Um, and this is consistent with plasmid conjugation between genotypes that generates new lineages of pathogens. So this first graph represents a single plasmid cluster found in 21 different genotypes of agrobacterium. And these strains are found in multiple US states and multiple and three different countries. Um, and the second graph here shows uh, plasmids that um, differ by two SNPs that are found in different chromosomal genotypes of agro that differ by more than 20,000 SNPs. So the strains themselves are very different, but they carry, carry essentially identical plasmids. So it's, it's really important to note that we can't apply direction between these sites, nor can we imply direct conjugation, only that it occurred um, in the history of these two lineages. So in most of these cases, these are most likely indirect transmission events, um, but they still carry the same plasmid in very different genotypes. So nevertheless, on the other hand, while that also applies here, these particular strains are really good candidates for where there may have been a direct conjugation because both of the strains were found in the same location. So here we have evidence that plasmic conjugation is likely occurring within individual nurseries. So we have three different examples of this where strains from the same location um, are highlighted in yellow here. And in each case, the plasmid is the same but it's found in different genotypes of agrobacterium and sometimes different biovars or genomo species entirely, so very different strains. And this is consistent, each of these cases essentially are consistent with plasmid conjugation occurring between a pathogen and a local strain of agrobacterium. And this is potentially generating new lineages of pathogens within a nursery. So in summary, we were able to model the epidemiology of agrobacterium and we identified key transmission patterns. What we've done is something slightly different from what's been done in the past um, in that we modeled the chromosome and the plasmids independently. So in order to do this, we first had to generate an evolutionary framework for both strains and plasmids. And this turned out to be really essential for accurately um, comparing the strains and the plasmids. Um, and with this composite data set, we now have very detailed data and greater resolution on patterns of transmission. Modeling the transmission of both two molecules independently gave us a much more accurate picture of what was actually happening um, in these nurseries and growing sites. And in contrast, the patterns seen in hospitals in human diseases, where we have super fit genotypes that are emerging, we instead see a wide diversity of agrobacterium causing disease, oftentimes in the same nursery. Um, and human activities are also really likely to be contributing to the spread of agrobacterium and the creation of new pathogenic lineages. 
but you can see that this whole genome sequencing method is very cost effective and this kind of method is already being used to track foodborne pathogens for example but as you can see from this data set it's definitely something that is applicable in agriculture and something that we can definitely use moving forward in the future so with that again um, I showed their pictures earlier, but I would really like to acknowledge these following people for their important contributions to this work. I'd also like to thank our funding sources. So this work was funded by uh, the USDA, SCRI, NSF, um, and I was funded by a USDA NEFA fellowship. So I'd like to thank those resources. And I thank you for inviting me to give this seminar and be happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much, Alexandra. We do have some questions, um, mm -hmm. and thank you for putting the numbers on the slides because that actually helps. So on your slide 22, are there any genes that are found both in the chromosome and TI or RI plasmid? And yes. if so, oh, did this complicate the approach that you That used? is an excellent question. Um, and that is something that we had to deal with because there are genes found on both the chromosome and the plasmid. And so what we had to do essentially was for each strain, we had to align the sequencing reads for that strain back to its own genome, and then only extract the reads that mapped to a particular replicon and use that for the separate analyses. So we did have to take that into account because there's definitely genes found on both but we were trying to minimize that impact by at least letting those reads map preferentially to the chromosome or the plasmid. Great. To continue on that, uh, could this approach of modeling molecules independently also be applied to chromosomal regions that are mobile? Um, yes, so that's actually something we're, we're trying to do right now. So for some of those collaborations, so there's for example, um, Brady rhizobia has symbiosis islands in the genome or um, streptomyces has pathogenicity islands. And these are mobile genetic elements, but they're within the genome. And so as long as you can define those regions and analyze them independently, you could definitely, um, you could apply this kind of method to that. You would just have to adapt it to, instead of different replicons, it would have to be different regions of the genome. And in some cases, this might depend more on how well you have a genome assembly. So these mobile genetic elements are often carrying very uh, repetitive sequences that make it very difficult to assemble them and identify. Um, and so that's where like things like nanopore sequencing has really helped us out because we can get much more complete assemblies that way. But yeah, it's definitely something you could apply to um, genomic islands. So you mentioned the uh, technology and using uh, the Oxford Nanopore technology. Um, in general, for your whole genome sequences, you, you mentioned you use HiSeq. Was that HiSeq 1 or HiSeq 2? Uh, HiSeq 3000. OK. And yeah. then um, for your Oxford Nanopore, how, to what extent are these closed genomes? And from a standpoint of quality, did you actually take them all the way to closed or are they still in draft? So we only used nanopore sequencing for just a handful of genomes that were of particular interest. So for a genome that had a, a novel TI plasma type that wasn't completely assembled, we used the nanopore for that strain. In most cases, the TI plasmids with just Illumina sequencing were either completely assembled or they were similar enough to another TI plasmid that we could just um, compare the contigs themselves to piece it together. So we only really needed nanopore sequencing for a handful of our strains, but it was very useful for the ones where we didn't know the true structure of, say, the TI plasmid. And when you used Oxford nanopore, did you do a hybrid approach? Did you use both? So you use both to get a better assembly, basically. So That's yeah, right. Very yeah, I don't think either one on its own was good enough. So when we tried just nanopore, the there were too many errors. Right. But when we combined them with hybrid assembly, we got essentially complete genomes of high quality. Yeah, great. So one of the things that we're interested in in, in the Phytobiomes Alliance is rapid uh, in situ sequencing for diagnostics. And you did not do that 
you didn't use Oxford Nanopore for that purpose. You basically drew the samples and then. then That's used, right. Do you see that as something that could be really beneficial in the future? I think it can be very useful for rapid diagnostics. So in this case, um, from our classification and characterization of the TI plasmids, um, the fact that we see a limited number of types, that information could be used maybe to develop some kind of rapid test kit. If we know there's certain genes that are highly conserved in all the types, those could be used for something like a nanopore um, rapid diagnostics type of thing. Great. So. All right. Um, this is getting back to the TIRI plasmids. Have, do they? Do you think they have multiple lineages which have involved, evolved independently? Of of plasmids. Mm -hmm. um, so we. I think um, one of the things. This is kind of maybe answering that question, but one of the things we looked into was how the TI plasmids and the RI plasmids differ from each other. Um, because both of those are essentially a similar concept and they have related virulence genes, but one of them causes hairy roots and one causes um, uh, crown galls. And what we see is that um, they, the virulence genes are related, but there was this deep split in the relationship between them, so they diverged very early on, but there was still movement of genes back and forth between them. And then as far as the plasmids themselves, there was so much evidence of horizontal gene transfer of genes between TI plasmids that it, it made it very difficult to, to um, differentiate them. And we do have evidence that we have one strain that has both a TI plasmid and an RI plasmid in the same strain. So we know these plasmids can coexist in the same cells. Um, so this genes can move between them. Great. Did you see any host effects on the distribution of lineages? So that's something I didn't have time to get into um, for today, but that is something that we looked into is if there was, um, say, preferences of host for different plasma types or chromosomal backgrounds. And we found that certain plasma types, so these are wide host range bacteria or plasmids, but Essentially, we found that certain plasmid types were more often found on woody hosts, like uh, fruit trees or rows or other plants, and other plasmid types were found almost exclusively on herbaceous plants. And then certain um, lineages of agrobacteria also tend to have preferences for um, specific host types, but it wasn't really like a specific host. It was more of like a general trend. Was it related at all to microbial communities that might have been involved, or did you actually do any metagenomics associated with this? Um, so that's something we were interested in, but we didn't have a lot of data on that, um, like the overall community of a crown gall. We do know that crown galls are very diverse communities, and there's other bacteria that are present there as well. Um, but we don't know how the specific, apart from Biovar 3, which is host limited, so that only causes disease on grapevine. Um, for the other strains, we don't know if that's a strain specific thing or an interaction with the community or not. So that remains to be seen. Yeah, do you have plans to do additional studies in that arena? Um, we have some ongoing work on the microbial communities in crown galls. So that's something that's ongoing. Um, I'm also interested in um, looking more into BioVar3 because we didn't have very good representation of Vitus. So what is the diversity of Agrobacterium Vitus and what's happening in those strains? And then we're also looking at these other systems as well. So uh, another question is, can, can you say that some strains have specific host preference conf confidently, or is it not possible to confidently say that yet? I think the only ones we really know that for sure is Biovar 3, so Agrobacterium vitis. The other ones, there's, we have seen the same plasmids or very similar plasmids on very different hosts. So I, we do have, um, there's specific lineages of Agrobacteria that appear to be host limited. Um, and this had already been known for the study. So Agrobacterium rubi, um, Agrobacterium larimori seem to be more host limited to specific hosts. But other than those, um, 
many of those have the same TI plasmids as, as the other uh, biovars. So going on a little bit different track, do you think it's possible to engineer agrobacterium or rhizobia for plant growth promotion as well as disease suppression? That is a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. There's, um, yeah, that, that would be a really interesting thing to see. There, so we do know that agrobacteria and rhizobia are very similar to each other. Or in many cases, agro is more similar to other rhizobia that are symbionts of plants. Um, but there's definite differences between them. So in the past, researchers have tried to put symbiosis plasmids in agrobacteria or TI plasmids in rhizobia, and they don't work very well. So it might, so the agro with a symplasmid might induce nodules, but very poorly, and it won't fix nitrogen. So there's definite differences between these bacteria, despite them being very closely related. So that would be really um, interesting to see, but I think it would be very difficult. Do you think this approach can be applied to track antibiotic resistance gene flow in soils or in fact in hospitals? I think this this could um, could probably this type of method could be adapted or um, to that kind of thing. As we saw from this one, it was very important to characterize the plasmids um, and understand how they were related to each other. And so I think if you wanted to adapt it to that kind of study, you would have to also characterize say mobile elements that carry antibiotic resistance genes because the classifications for strains and plasmids was very important to reduce false positives yeah um, all right so a, a kind of a comment with a question um, essentially you and your team's goal is to establish some order and a better understanding amidst this sea of unpredictability is that correct that's yeah. right all right, so what do you think about the theory in which TI or RI plasmids originate from so-called opine catabolic plasmids? That's a really good question. Um, so the, the opines are these, there's essentially this theory called the opine concept. So if agrobacterium is producing a crown gall, other bacteria can inhabit this gall um, and compete with it. And so agrobacterium is expending the energy to transform the plant to produce a gall, but it needs to get something from it um, in return. Otherwise, you know, other bacteria can outcompete it in that environment. And so these opines are these uncommon nutrients produced by the plant for the agrobacteria. And so in general, it's thought that only agrobacterium that induced that um, crown gall can utilize those particular opines because they're very diverse um, chemicals as well. Um, however, there are other bacteria that have been found to use certain opines. And so the idea is that um, if these opines are the most important part, because they're what's actually giving agro an advantage, it's possible that the um, TI or RI plasmids may have originated as maybe an opine catabolic plasmid. And then these other elements were brought in in order to either say increase the production of opines or pr um, produce even more opines. So the gall itself, that growth might just be to drive the production of even more opines for agrobacterium. And so that's how that, that hypothesis that these opines might have been the original factor in all of this, rather than producing a gall as the original um, end goal. So it's totally possible. Um, there are some strains of Ocrobactrum that have been reported to have TI plasmids. Did you find any chromosome types? So we didn't um, observe any Ocrobactrum with TI plasmids in this case. I think I, I saw a paper on that where they found that many of them were associated with um, hydroponic systems. So in many cases, it was um, rhizogenic plasmids where they're finding lots of diverse um, other rhizobia carrying TI or RI plasmids, but we didn't see any of those in that study. Um, we are continuing another study with other strange agrobacteria that we'd found before, and we're characterizing those as well. Um, but so far we haven't seen Ocrobactrum either. So it appears to be a rare thing. All right. Um, 
do BV2 like strains described in your paper carry TI or RI plasmids and are they tumorigenic? Yes, so that's one of the things that is very confusing about Agrobacterium taxonomy. So Biovar2 is the species name for that group is Rhizobium rhizogenes and Biovar1 is Agrobacterium tumefaciens. However, Biovar2 can carry TI plasmids and be tumorigenic and Biovar1 strains um, can carry RI plasmids and be rhizogenic. So the name is very confusing because either of these lineages can, can be rhizogenic or tumorigenic. So it's entirely dependent on the plasmids and the plasmids can be shared between these lineages. So it's pretty confusing. Yeah. All right, so um, in, your, in your talk, you mentioned about agrobacterium being extremely uh, diverse and that if you don't use the right reference, that you'll end up with high error rates. So how do you how do you actually go about selecting the right reference and making sure you have the right reference, particularly if you're a, if you don't have a closed genome to really right. Compare? So in this case, we didn't have closed genomes for all of our references um, or for all of our our situations. So we, we first separated everything into species level groups using like A and I. So these were all the individual species level groups. And there's this great algorithm encoded um, by this program, R Higher BAPS, where you can give it a phylogeny and, and other information, and it'll essentially identify specific lineages. So you have to know the evolutionary history as a context, and that will tell you groups of bacteria that are much more closely related. And in many cases, once we had those groups, we tried to pick the, the best assembled genome because again, poorly assembled genomes can cause issues with SNP calling as well. But in, in some cases that wasn't always possible. So we just picked the, um, essentially the most completely assembled genome within each group. So you really looked at quality and what, which, which ones had the highest quality. That's right. On. So, one of the things that we've been doing and working with uh, a group um, in Virginia Tech has been to try to develop a sequence-based classification system. Um, do you think that would have helped you to have used that instead of the SNP bases in terms I, of evolution? So I think that would be very useful. Um, I, that's uh, with Boris Finatzer. It is. So okay. I worked with him um, as a short postdoc after I graduated. Um, working with them on that system and so that is a um, that system is incredibly useful for this as, especially in cases where like you said the taxonomy is naming is confusing right. um, that system also uses a and i or average nucleotide identity to right. group things together and so it's um, a pretty similar concept in how useful it would be for identifying these specific groups of bacteria and how close they are yeah all right, uh, we have one last question. Uh, what is the follow-up work from your particular study, from this study that you haven't so, already mentioned? Yeah. Right, so uh, currently we're, we're applying this method to other pathogens and other mobile genetic element systems, um, the ones that I mentioned earlier on. So, oops, we're applying it this sort of thing to streptomyces. We're looking into Brady rhizobia and the symbiosis islands to see if we can apply it to these systems. Um, and then I'm also following up on Agrobacterium vitis. So Biovar 3 is very important for grapevine. And we had relatively poor um, representation of Biovar 3 strains. And so that's something I'm looking into as well to extend it. Great. Well, Alexandra, thank you very much for a, a really interesting uh, webinar and a, and a great presentation. And we look actually forward to seeing some of the follow on on work. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, the webinar has been recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. And with that, I'd like to thank you for participating in the Phytobiomes Alliance webinar series. So have a great day. Thank you.